Dan Glenn is a PhD candidate in the Transformative Studies Program at CIS. He was a Center for Writing and Scholarship Fellow at CIS for three years and was a co-instructor for the PhD Bridge Scholars, a three-year pilot program to support doctoral students on the journey towards dissertation writing. As part of his work with the Writing Center, Dan developed and hosted a podcast called Subversive Studies, which is available on SoundCloud. He currently works as an editor and writing coach. Nick Walker is a queer, transgender, flamingly autistic author and educator whose work explores the edges and intersections of somatic psychology, queer theory, neurodiversity, and creative transformation. Dr. Walker is a core faculty member in the somatic psychology and undergrad psychology program at CIS, a lifelong Zen practitioner, senior Aikido instructor at the Aiki Art Center in Berkeley, and co-creator of the Weird Luck webcomic. Her writings can be found at neuroqueer.com. And now, let me turn it over to Dan and Nick. Hey, Nick. Hey, everyone hey. out there. Um, this is great. I'm so excited and so honored to be able to be part of this. And um, I'm just, uh, I'm going to hold up your book real, real briefly here. I am super inspired by this and really excited to talk to you about it. I think your work is um, so timely and, and powerful right now. Um, and it's very needed. So um, thanks for putting it out there. And thanks for being here with me. Thank you for being here with me. Why don't we just begin by hearing a little bit about your new book, Neuroqueer Heresies, and um, just you could tell us a little about how it came to be. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, our, our full title is Neuroqueer Heresies, uh, Notes on the Neurodiversity Paradigm, Autistic Empowerment and Post-Normal Possibilities. And there's actually three, three sections to the book. There's one, there's a neurodiversity paradigm section and autistic empowerment section and this post-normal possibilities section. Um, kind of what happened was this book really is the result of a decade of work. I've been involved in uh, autistic community and culture and in the development of the neurodiversity movement since 2003. And uh, this, you know, this idea of neurodiversity emerged in the 1990s, this idea of uh, neurodiversity as the diversity of body minds, diversity of human minds and modes of neurocognitive functioning. And this is you know, an axis of, unit, of human diversity, like ethnic diversity and cultural diversity. And uh, a neurodiversity movement emerged, which was largely uh, emerged really over the course of the, the early 2000s and beyond, you know, over the course of this century. So far, this neurodiversity movement has emerged as largely a social justice focused movement of uh, looking at the social inequalities around, you know, how autistic people and other neurodivergent people are marginalized and abused in, uh, in within the dominant society and how that intersects, you know, other axes of marginalized identity. Um, I was, like I say, involved in autistic community and culture from very early on and in the emergence of the neurodiversity movement. And I started talking in somewhere in the early 2000s about the idea of this emerging neurodiversity paradigm and the idea that there was a paradigm shift that needed to happen between what I called the pathology paradigm uh, shifting over to the neurodiversity paradigm. So the idea is okay, the dominant cultural, uh, the dominant cultural paradigm around neurodiversity is this idea that there's, there's, yes, there's this wide diversity of minds, but there's one right way to be, there's one right way for minds to work. And if you deviate too much from that in certain ways, then there's something wrong with you and it's pathologized. And it's like, okay, how can we cure you? How can we make you normal? 
And so the neurodiversity paradigm, the contrast is like, this is, no, this is another axis of human diversity to say that one type of mind is superior, one mode of the functioning of the body mind is superior uh, to others is like saying, well, one ethnicity is superior or one culture is superior. You know, it just leads to uh, these social power inequalities and into society and to society not getting uh, the benefit of human diversity and the creative synergy that it fuels. So, uh, so yeah, coining this term, the neurodiversity paradigm, it's like, cause there was already this growing neurodiversity movement. So I'm like, okay, neurodiversity paradigm is what, what we're aiming for. What does a movement aim for? It aims for a paradigm shift away from the pathology paradigm to the neurodiversity paradigm. And there was a kind of a whole vocabulary around that of what is neurodiversity? What is this paradigm? What does it mean to be a uh, neurotypical, you know, a member of this dominant uh, way of functioning versus uh, neurodivergent in various ways, being a neurominority group? Um, how do we talk about this? How do we how do we shift our language away from the language of the old paradigm that frames, you know, say autism or dyslexia as, as disorders or medical conditions? And I was also doing a lot of work at the same time around just autistic empowerment and what it means to be autistic when you don't view it through a pathologizing lens. Uh, what does it mean to thrive as an autistic person? Because the pathology paradigm kind of has built into this idea that you can't thrive as an autistic person because you have this terrible disorder. So um, what does it mean to thrive as an autistic person? And how do you want to create spaces where that can happen? Uh, so there's all of this work around um, uh, 2011, I first wrote up this essay called Throw Away the Master's Tools, uh, inspired by Audre Lorde's uh, famous saying, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. I wrote this essay uh, uh, for uh, first because I've been writing in, you know, online autistic forums and such. But I was like, OK, let's write something for publication. Let's write something to put out there that defines the pathology paradigm, the neurodiversity paradigm, and what it means to shift from one to the other. And that really took off in a big way in terms of uh, the influence it had culturally and on the development of the movement. So I wrote uh, more stuff. And so over the course of the decade or so, I produced, uh, over the course of the past decade, I produced a bunch of different uh, essays addressing various aspects of autistic empowerment and the neurodiversity paradigm. Um, a shift happened for me uh, in 2008 when I came up with this term neuroqueer or this term neuroqueer uh, came to me and that was very much uh, less about the social justice aspects of the neurodiversity movement and more about um, the creative aspects of it. And uh, what, okay, given this existence of, uh, you know, this concept of neurodiversity and the neurodivergence, what does it mean to play with that creatively and to creatively play with our own psyches and our own embodiments? And uh, this sort of my ongoing fascination has always been just trans transformation, personal and cultural, and especially uh, personal embodied transformation. And so, uh, Oh, yeah, I'll talk more a little bit about that, this development of neuroqueer, but that, uh, that became really more and more the focus of my own interest. And so in a sense, this book is a bridge um, because it starts with that old, you know, decade old essay or dozen year old essay, throw away the master's tools, defining the paradigms and has this whole section about, you know, the neurodiversity paradigm, what it means to make that shift in the paradigm, the language around it, and it goes into these 
uh, uh, writings on autistic empowerment and this non-pathologizing view of autism in particular. And that's sort of like, I wanted to get this out there. I wanted to get all this stuff in one place and make this my gift to the autistic community and to the neurodiversity movement and to the, the culture and society in which I live. And the final section of the book, which I, is, is called Post-Normal Possibilities, is focused on neuroqueering and uh, has this you know, really you know, a long final essay that's new about neuro, what I call neuroqueer theory. And so in a sense, the, the book was a way to get all of, my, all of my old work in one place and to sort of uh, about half of it is old stuff. The book is old stuff and half is brand new stuff that I just wrote uh, over the past year, just for the book, because I started thinking like, this is my last chance to say something about this stuff. This is the last time I want to write essays about neurodiversity. What, what's, what do I want to make sure to say? And there was just more and more of it. So mix of old material, new material, new commentary on old material. But like I say, a bridge between my old work and this increasing focus I have on the idea of neuroqueering and the creative potentials of the concept of neurodiversity. Wonderful. Um, yeah, I, I think the, I, 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 was, I was impressed how seamlessly the new and old material kind of is woven together throughout. And I love these little, um, there's there's intro sections to each uh, piece, which um, almost feels like a little behind the like a VH1 behind the music or something like kind of contextualizing mm -hmm. um, as I date myself, uh, but contextualizing like you know what it, particularly the older pieces you know um, and even in some way in some sense you're um, you know mentioning certain aspects of your thinking that have evolve further um, since that time or something that that has changed or um, the wider scope of the, the field as well. Um, and yeah, that third, I'm, I'm definitely a huge fan of that third and final section, the post-normal section, um, because that, um, that creative uh, energy that you talk about, the, the transformative quality is so palpable in there and it just makes I, I think it really makes the reader excited to um, to explore. And like, I, I think there is this, you know, you mentioned like this phrase, the horizon of creative possibility or transformative possibility. And I think that's so um, woven deeply into the material. Um, maybe you could, as you mentioned, you could talk, talk a little more about it and maybe you could do that now, uh, this term neuroqueering and neuroqueer. Um, yeah. Where did it come from and how can people um, think about it? Okay, well, it actually, I mean, this is great advertising here given that this is a, a talk through CIS public programs, but it actually came to me in a CIS class. So uh, this, it, is, it is the product of a CIS graduate education. So uh, I was, um, you know, I've been teaching uh, in the uh, somatic psychology program and I, I love, uh, somatic psychology and this whole idea of transformation through embodied practice. And I'm a graduate of the somatic psychology program. So in the spring of 2008, I was a, a first year student in the somatic psychology program at CIS taking a psychodynamics class, a class which I now teach. Um, but I was taking the psychodynamics class uh, with Dr. Ian Grant, who was uh, uh, a core faculty in the somatics program for many years and uh, passed on in a few years ago now. Uh, uh, he was a tremendous uh, influence on me, just a wonderful, fascinating guy and such a, a force for uh, creativity and transformation and everything he did and really wanted to bring out the uh, the creative in his students and get people uh, uh, engaged in the creative possibilities of the work that we were doing. And so uh, 
I was in Ian's class and he assigned, uh, we were talking about this particular thing that was a point of fascination for Ian and it was a fascination that he definitely passed on to me and changed my life with, which is how, uh, how do we get cut off from our natural vitality and spontaneous creative flow and spontaneous creative responsiveness to the world and our, our joy, our, our vitality, our joy, our ability to make a spontaneous, authentic response uh, to, to the world and an authentic, spontaneous, unique contribution to the world from that comes from something authentic in, in who we are that emerges uh, through the body in a sense, through, you know, how do we how do we tap into the heart and the gut and the all of the parts of our and potentials of our conscious and unconscious minds and just uh, live a life where we're continually joyfully birth, birthing the spontaneous and uh, novel and creative. And this is, I think, the natural birthright of every human being. And we can see it in the, you know, in the play of, of small children and such. And it's, um, uh, we get cut off from it. People get cut off from that by the traumas of growing up and by the fact that certain parts of themselves are not welcome, that they're trained to a particular styles of embodiment and particular like, oh no, you can't do that. You have to act this way, act normal, you know, act, act this way, comply with these cultural norms and depending on who you are and what sort of family and society and cultural environment you're living in, you know, there can be dire consequences uh, for falling, slipping out of the cultural norms, which can be anything depending on who you are again, from, you know, a rejection by parents to being shot by police, you know, there's, uh, there's so many reasons that people are so many and so many ways in which people are trained to be fearful and to have to repress certain aspects of the self. And that happens on a bodily level, like what are the tensions that people unconsciously hold on to to keep themselves from gestures of spontaneous expression because it's not safe to be ex spontaneously expressive of one's full self in one's developmental environment. And so then the question becomes, how do you reverse that process? How do you free yourself from those tensions? How do you liberate the psyche through liberating the embodiment and regain access to that joyful creative vitality and to this authentic self-expression? And you'll get, get loosen up all of those, uh, all of those deep tensions that are the physical mechanism of psychological repression and free oneself from that and say, well, okay, who am I really? And what is the fluid, the fluid protein being underneath that, uh, underneath all these tensions? So that fascinated Ian and it fascinates me and really is, is like you know, kind of the, the the primary focus of my life's uh, work. So anyway, I had us in the psychodynamics class playing with this idea and writing essays about, uh, about our own experience with this. What is your own experience of Re having to learning to repress aspects of yourself, of having to put up some facade and the tensions that hold that in place, have to put, a, so put up some facade for survival reasons, to comply with ac external demands. Do you have an experience of liberating yourself from that or of discovering how you're stuck and how you've become fixed in a particular embodiment that limits you? Um, so, I'm writing into that and thinking about my, my own childhood. And I was thinking at the time, um, I was very focused. Again, I'd been, you know, at that point I'd been 
uh, very immersed in the autistic community and culture for about, about five years. And I was really thinking a lot about autistic self-liberation. And so I was thinking how autistic people have very distinctive ways of, of moving and uh, how, you know, how I learned as a child that I had to hide that. You know how I how I had to suppress my natural embodiment and ways of moving and develop this pulled inward tension uh, to keep from being targeted and abused uh, by kids and adults alike. And I'd carried that you know for many years and had started this process of breaking out of it and rediscovering how my body wanted to move and. Uh, discovering all this creative access and improvement in mental functioning and psychological well-being as a result of that. So I'm writing about that, and then I started thinking about my my uh, what I thought of at the time as my gender queerness, um, uh, which eventually turned out as I got deeper into it. You know, eventually figured out, oh my god, I'm a trans woman. You know, uh, but at the time I just thought about my gender queerness and my uh, androgyny in my youth and how I'd put on uh, for survival, you know, growing up in very violent surroundings, very violent neighborhoods, and then being homeless for a lot of my 20s, uh, really I'd put on this intense facade of um, toxic masculinity as, uh, as a defense. And I was thinking about that and what it would mean to break out of that. And what hit me was the process by which I put on a facade of neurotypicality and uh, you know, put on this, this facade where I suppressed my autistic embodiment and the process by which I repressed my feminine embodiments uh, under this facade of masculinity, that those processes work the same. And you know, we have this idea from like, you know, in queer theory, you know, from thanks to, to Judith Butler, who I adore, we have this idea of gender as an embodied performance that's learned and deeply ingrained in our bodily habits. And so it was like, okay, you know, there's this heteronormative performance that we get trained into, whatever, you know, you get assigned a binary gender at birth based on your, you know, the shape of your genitalia. And then it's like you get trained to embody this particular thing that's unnatural to you. And there's, you know, punishments, you know, anything from ridicule to physical attack for deviating from your assigned gender role and from the embodiment of it. You know, as a boy, I got regularly, you know, attacked for moving like an autistic person, but also for moving like a girl. Uh, so the, um, uh, what I saw was these processes were the same. And I started exploring that idea in this paper and this essay I was writing for Ian Grant's class about, um, how those processes paralleled each other. The, the, uh, the process of, um, heteronormativity, you know, uh, being indoctrinated bodily into heteronormativity and having to build a facade of heteronormativity to protect myself and sort of hide my queerness. And then like, okay, there's also the facade of what I started calling neuronormativity that I had to do to hide my autistic embodiment. So first it was like, okay, these two are parallel. And as I thought into it and felt into it more, I was like, they're not just parallel, they're entwined to to embody heteronormative embodiment, you know, if you're embodying the societal standard of heteronormativity, that's also neuronormative. When they say, you know, act like, act like, act like a man, act like a woman, you know, act like a boy, act like a girl, in this heteronormative sense, that they mean like a, a neurotypical boy or girl, man or woman. Nobody's, you know, the the enforcers of of normativity don't want you acting like an autistic 
man or an autistic woman or an autistic gender fluid person, it's very specifically neuronormativity is implied in there. Um, and likewise, when, you know, when abusive behavioral therapies are inflicted on autistic children to try to force them to act neuronormative, they're also heteronormative. They're trying to get them to act like uh, non-autistic boys or non-autistic girls, depending on what gender they were assigned at birth. And if you deviate far enough from heteronormativity in terms of what you do with your body and such, you start building new neural pathways and deviating from uh, norm neuronormativity as well. And likewise, if your mind gets weird enough and your embodied psyche gets weird enough and further away from the neurotypicality, well, you're also deviating from heteronormative performance. And so somehow it's like, okay, you know, we know like queer theory is like gender can be queered, right? You can, you can, there's this neuronormative performance that's, or sorry, there's this heteronormative performance that's imposed on everyone, but we can queer that, meaning we can defy it or deviate from it or challenge it or subvert it or creatively fuck with it and alter, am I allowed to say fuck in this conversation? I'm not sure, but uh, we're allowed to, you know, we can do these things where we, we escape, we liberate ourselves from heteronormativity and this is called uh, queering. Right, we're we're queering we're queering our gender, we're queering our sexuality, uh, and I love this the idea of queer as uh, a verb. You know, it's an action to queer to uh, to uh, break away from the heteronormative performance, and at the same time, you know, we can queer our uh, our body minds. We can queer neuronormative performance. We can queer our our minds and our psyches and get away from norm, neuronormative limitations of thought and embodiment and explore like what are the potentials of autistic uh, autistic movement and autistic cognition and the autistic body mind and how far can we take this away from neuronormativity and what lies outside those boundaries and so neuroqueer theory boils down, what neuroqueer theory is essentially extends queer theory into the realm of neurodiversity and says, one, uh, neuronormativity can be queered just like heteronormativity can be and should be. And two, the queering of neuronormativity and the queering of heteronormativity are entwined. So if you queer one of those enough, you're also starting to queer the other. So much there. All right, let's think about how we want to proceed because I think what you just said is so rich and um, I almost want to let people like have a second to just digest <laughs> it. Um, but let's, so I think there's there's a few aspects that I have in mind to, to kind of proceed with. Um, the embodied aspect that you've been talking about is so present in your work. Um, it's a vitally essential part of um, what you are trying to convey um, through your writing and through your work. Um, and you also talk a bit in your defining neurodiversity piece about um, how people um, commonly, you know, hear neurodiversity or neurodivergence and think um, neuro means brain, but that it doesn't mean brain, it means nerve. Mm -hmm. And that in, from your perspective, um, we're actually talking about the entire nervous system. Mm -hmm. um, and you have this great, you, I love your writing, by the way. It's just oh, so, um, it's so both, um, simple and comprehensible and, and beautiful and intricate at once. Um, but you have this line, that, so by extension, the full complexity of human cognition and the central role the nervous system plays in the embodied dance of consciousness. And I think a lot of people just think brain because mm -hmm. it's, it's, you see this commonly in the discourse, autistic brain, my neurodivergent brain, and it's, it seems like it's been perhaps one important step um, 
in helping to spread uh, the, the concept of neurodiversity and neurodivergence, um, but also, as you say, is reductive. Um, so I guess I'm interested in, in if you could say a little more about um, the embodied embodiment aspect of your work, maybe if you have examples of um, how you have worked with this process of neuroqueering in an embodied way, and also how that connects to your relationship with your nervous system and um, mm -hmm. how others might begin to think about their nervous system and their own embodiment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have this wonderful concept in, in modern neuroscience called neuroplasticity, which is, you know, I mean, which is about brains and the idea that the brain is plastic. It can, it, it can rewrite itself. It is continually rewriting itself based on experience and action and continually evolving that the brain is not a computer, but more like an ecosystem and, you know, pathways that are explored, uh, develop further. You start using your body and mind in particular ways and new neural pathways form and uh, what doesn't get used atrophies and fades. And so there's this continuous evolution of consciousness that's possible and that's biologically possible because of neuroplasticity, but the brain is not isolated. Like I said, as you quoted, you know, the um, neuro means nerve. There's a whole central and peripheral nervous system and it's all connected. Our brain, we're not brains driving around in bodies the way people drive around in cars. We're, we're body minds, we're complete systems consciousness and the brain is part of the body and shares blood and all sorts of interesting chemicals with the rest of the body and is wired into the body with all these amazing nerves that run throughout the body and so what we do there's a feedback loop continually it's two-way it's not just you know mind controls body but uh, but embodied action and embodied experience shape the, the mind by shaping and rewriting the brain. The brain is more like the interface between consciousness and embodiment. And so we do this, uh, you start changing how you move and how you sense and how you relate to the world and embody yourself in the world and you are altering your consciousness and developing new capacities and so what i found um as when my embodiment was constrained and limited and traumatized into this very rigid pulled in state, my ability to connect creatively and joyfully with the world was also constrained. And as I started liberating and seeing oh, there's, there's some vestige, there's some, my hand wants to do this. And what if I just let it? And there was this process of learning to feel into what did my body actually want to do? What were all these things I suppressed? There were still vestiges of that there in some bodily memory of what brought me joy in early childhood. And I just followed those things. And that took a lot of work. That was a lot of, um, a lot of work in Aikido and a lot of work in uh, somatic psychology and various forms of somatic work, authentic movement and Reiki and work and such, and extensive uh, physical theater work, extensive, uh, uh, it was a member for two decades of uh, uh, this uh, experimental physical theater group called Paratheatrical Research, where, you know, really exploring deep capacities of, of the body to give expression to unconscious forces and so there was a really extensive transformative process that is still going on for me. It's still always going on and always work I'm doing, but it's really um, 
follow the embodiment, follow the impulses, let them do what they want, be this, uh, be in the dance of engagement with the world and with the bodily impulses and stirrings all of the time. And that keeps transforming the mind and my experience is that continually there's a negative feedback loop that comes, um, you know, a, 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 a sort of a, a, a spiral of a spiral of trauma and re, re, repression, where our physical tensions and restrictions and embodied traumas keep us locked into uh, fearful mindsets, and that in turn encourages a more fearful cut off from the world embodiment, which reinforces the mindset and so people spiral in that direction, but one can reverse the spiral and spiral outward and say, well, uh, if I start liberating the body, you know, something, what's the, uh, what the old saying, uh, free, free your ass and your mind will follow. It's like, yeah, start, start liberating the body, liberating the body, getting the body moving, finding the physical joy. And there's this creative impulse and joyful engagement that starts getting released. And one can follow that further and further into this accelerating spiral of vitality and creativity and well being and weirdness because this we're talking about neuroqueering here we're talking about we're talking about queering normativity like this is definitely like this means stop moving like a damn normal person you know really really lean into the weirdness and dance into the weirdness and that's where the liberation happens and the the uh the creative capacities start getting developed outside of the the uh little box of normative thinking yeah i love that aspect of um when you when you're talking about this and writing about this this um the weirdness and the and the very um, intentional uh subverting of these uh neurotypical norms heteronormative norms um and just the uh potential that that has to unlock so much and it seems like uh this notion of uh, i love this reversing the spiral um because it feels like there's uh, there's something very intuitive um and very very non-conceptual it's not about thinking uh how do i want to move how do i think i need to be or it's actually how do i intuitively feel my body wants to express and and then how can i trust that and i think that's feels like also the rub of like you know um really learning to trust oneself in this process um and i imagine there's also this aspect of really um sometimes struggle for people because you're you're really you are going against the grain of what's been uh, a lot of conditioning and, and potential, um, you know, like like you said, uh, tr processes of embodying um, cultural norms that you um, may not have even known you were you were embodying. Mm -hmm. um, and to this end, you you also talk about um, neuroqueering as a practice with which anyone can engage. Yes. And I I would love to hear more about that. I think this is one of the most interesting, um, I don't know, prov maybe provocative. May I don't know if people would say that, but I think there's something, I think people have this idea, some people might have this idea that, you know, either you're neurodivergent or you're not, or like you're queer or you're not. And these are like, this is not for me or this, you know, some kind of um, gatekeeping or something like that. Right. So I'd be curious to hear um, more about how this is a practice with which anyone can engage. Yes, it's a practice with which anyone can engage. Um, <laughs> you too can neuroqueer. And uh, this is, uh, there is, a lot of so much societal discourse these days is governed by an essentialist identity politics. Um, you are 
you are born this, you are born this way, and this is who you are. You're like this because you're born this way and as part of your essence, and this is not for you because you weren't born this way. And that's, you know, everything from like, uh, you know, the, the uh, old, you know, decades old idea in the gay rights movement of like, we're gay because we're born that way, which is kind of a defensive strategy in a way of saying, you know, we can't help it. We're born that way, accept us because we can't help it. We're born that way to like, you know, white supremacism is also, you know, identity politics at its most extreme. You know, it is funny because the term identity politics gets associated with social justice movements a lot, but the right wing politics is also very based identity politics. Um, and there's this tendency towards essentialism of you're this type of person and you're this type of person and you have these this set of intersecting identities and it becomes very rigid very easily, in, especially in a, a, a culture of extremely polarized uh, us and them discourse, which seems to be uh, also across the political spectrum. Um, and so uh, I'm not an essentialist. I'm all about fluidity and continual uh, creation and recreation and yeah, we get boxes that society sticks us in, you know, there's going to be people are going to get, you know, certain amounts of privilege or abuse based on just what color skin they were born with. And that's a current reality. But how fluid can we make these identities? How much can we play with it? And, you know, so I love this queer theory idea um, you know, core, uh, central to a lot of queer theory is this anti-essentialism. If gender is something you do rather than something you're born with, it's something, it's something you do and therefore it's something that you can play with and it's something you can alter. It is fluid and there's, uh, you know, it has this potential uh, for fluidity and therein lies this opportunity for gender creativity and sexual creativity. Yeah, people are maybe born with certain sexual leanings. There's definitely people who are like, okay, you know, I was just like, I don't know why, I'm just wired to be heterosexual or I'm wired to be homosexual. You know, I'm just attracted to this particular type of person and not this particular type and that's the way I am. And maybe it's innate and people are born that way. But there's also so much room for exploration and fluidity in terms of heteronormativity and how people can deviate from it and how people can specialize, you know, nobody, um, you know, you can be born, you know, uh, a lesbian, maybe, you know, you're born with a natural proclivity, you know, a woman born with a natural proclivity to be drawn uh, sexually to other women, but, um, you know, nobody's born like a, a BDSM leather dyke, you know, that is, that is a series of like, cultural influences and cultural choices and ways of exploring particular excitations and exploring particular possibilities and evolving towards a particular gender and sexual identity and set of pleasures. Um, that's a product of fluidity. So there's this, there's this exciting fluidity that happens um, and I want to encourage more of that and less fixed essentialist categories. And that's thanks to queer theory, you know, it's widespread in queer theory. And so there's an, a growing sense of gender fluidity in certain, in queer cultures. And there's a very strong resistance to it, both from the right wing and from, you know, uh, uh, second wave feminist gender essentialists as well. Uh, there's a great deal of resistance to a lot of the fluidity happening around gender, but there's also a lot of like 
a growing number of people, I think, especially in the younger generations who recognize the potential fluidity of gender and sexuality and that it's something that can be played with. Well, I'm part of this idea of neuroqueering is the same thing is the case around neurodiversity and the queering of neuronormativity. I'm not an essentialist there. And yeah, I'm autistic. You know, I'm autistic. I was born with a particular, you know, a uh, particular mode of cognitive functioning that does, that is definitely distinctly minority, you know, that is different from that of many people. And I can, I can talk to other autistic people and say there are significant commonalities. You know, there's a reason, there is a reason to have this idea of autistic because there's a, you know, like 2% of the human population has these certain commonalities among us, even though we're wildly diverse among us, we have these certain commonalities and we can say, okay, yeah, we could fit it. We can say there's a category of autistic and that is useful. You know, it can be very uh, useful to form identities um, as long as one doesn't get stuck in thinking, you know, in its mode of thinking, that's all essentialist identity politics and, you know, what boxes a person fit in and they're in that forever. Um, because neurotypicality, you know, neurotypical, this term neurotypical emerged in the autistic community way back in the early 90s and was the idea that neurotypicals are people with the normal brains. And so it's a sort of way of talking about what is the dominant majority, the people who conform to neuronormativity, but there's no such thing as a normal brain. There's no neurotypical brain. There's just people who can uh, who can comfortably or somewhat comfortably perform neuronormativity throughout their lives uh, more, more effectively and with less strain than say autistic people can, but there's no, there's no such thing as a neurotypical brain. And I don't really buy into the idea of types of brains, the idea of, and so much of the discourse on neurodiversity has become this essentialist thinking on types of brains. And so, um, it's, uh, you know, like you're just, you're born with an autistic brain or you're born with a neurotypical brain, you're born with an ADHD brain or, or whatever. That seems very limiting to me. I mean, I've learned lots of things from people who are neurotypical or who are neurodivergent in ways that differ from mine and I've integrated them and altered my own consciousness with that. Uh, and altered my own capacities. And, you know, people do that all the time. Part of, part of what I say here is, you know, that's already a thing. We don't think about it as being part of like the neurodiversity movement because the neurodiversity movement, again, is particular, specifically tends to be a social justice movement around, you know, civil rights for autistic people and ADHD people and people with Down syndrome. And, but there's, there's, uh, there's lots of ways to diverge from neuronormativity and that includes meditating every day because that alters your consciousness, that alters your brain, that physically alters your brain and you get a, you do a, a meditation practice you know, every day for years, you are not neurotypical anymore. You are not thinking like the dominant, like the dominant majority you do a lot of psychedelics, you know, you start seeing trails full time from doing enough psychedelics and, you know, get your creativity permanently opened up and made weird by lots of psychedelics use. You have neuroqueered yourself. So there's, you know, intentional neurodivergence has always been with us long before that the terminology existed for it. And, you know, I'm very influenced by autistic culture and, um, queer theory and stuff, but also by stuff like the works of Tim Leary and Robert Anton Wilson about how do you, how do you creatively play with your own consciousness and expand your intelligence in exotic new ways. So uh, all of that is neuroqueering. And yeah, it's like, you don't have to be born gay or trans to queer your gender by being like, yeah, I'm assigned male at birth and I'm going to explore my femininity and stop performing this bit of masculinity that's a complete, you know, complete drag, no pun intended. Um, or, uh, 
and by the same token, you know, you, you uh, don't have to be born neurodivergent. You have to be born autistic or dyslexic or uh, ADHD or whatever in order to neuroqueer because anybody can alter their consciousness with the right practices and deviate from normativity with the right practices. Got a little, uh, some, something some kind of psychedelic the sound there. Yeah. Yeah. You're, uh, that's what happens. You're queering all of us. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. Things just get, things just get weird when you even start talking about this stuff enough. So yeah, no, I think, um, uh, yeah, so I, I called the book Neuroqueer Heresies and, um, you know, I really meant that idea of it, you know, being heretical because it's heretical, you know, the early stuff, I mean, by, by the standards of the dominant culture, you know, that pathologizes autistic people and, you know, treats autism as some sort of psychological disorder or medical condition, you know, my basic stuff on autistic empowerment and the neurodiversity paradigm is heretical, but I'm also heretical by the standards of the neurodiversity movement, you know, because I'm not an essentialist, because, you know, the neuro, neuro, neuroqueer theory is heretical because I'm, you know, I am not interested in this essentialist idea of uh, uh, types of brains and you're just born with this type of brain. I'm like, yeah, you're born with whatever brain you're born with and maybe that's autistic or something, but whatever brain you're born with, you can queer it and develop it. It's yours to develop creatively and anybody can explore the weird. Anybody can narrow queer. And yeah, so I'm very much against gatekeeping. I'm very much against, uh, you know, uh, people who gatekeep the term queer in the first place. Like that was always an experience of mine as a, you know, as a young, as a young queer activist, you know, in, in, in my, in my teens in the 1980s, you know, there were like young queers who were like, yeah, we're just gonna, we're just gonna queer gender boundaries and go out and to, you know, go out and cross dress and participate in, you know, uh, street actions and our, our queer cross dressed sort of way. And then there was, you know, old, older gay people who were like, you know, you can't use the term queer unless you were born gay. And we're like, no way, no, screw that. You know, that's like, and in fact, a lot of those, you know, older, older generation of gay people were very opposed to the word queer because they were used to it being a slur and the idea of reclaiming it was just uh, too, too, too blasphemous. Um, and yet now, you know, there's more and more just gleefully queer young people. I love the younger generations and how gleefully, joyfully queer they are and not constrained by gender boundaries. And that's where I wanna see this concept of neurodiversity go. And so I, right away, as soon as we put, uh, as soon as I put the term neuroqueer out there, me and some other people who were, you know, other fellow scholars who were uh, uh, playing with the term, as soon as it got out there, people started trying to gatekeep it. And be like, you can't call yourself neuroqueer unless you were born autistic and gay. It's, nope, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about uh, nobody's born neurotypical and anybody can creatively diverge from neuronormativity and heteronormativity. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're getting a little bit close to the Q&A. And Ooh, um, Q &A. Be before we get there, I wanted to be sure to ask you, um, I hope maybe some some of the Q&A people will ask some of the things uh, I would have loved to ask you too, because there's just, there's so much here, uh, or maybe we'll have to just have another conversation sometime. We just but, might. Um, so, yeah, I mean, one thing I just want to kind of like reflect on, as you said that, is there's so, I feel like the, the field of um, neurodiversity studies has just really, um, opened up and become like so almost like suddenly to me it seemed like suddenly uh, so much more mainstream and kind of in in the consciousness uh just in the past few years even absolutely and, and so i wonder if um you know just in the same way that you know the mainstream understanding of gender has shifted so much um in recent years as well like that um maybe 
this concept of neuroqueering um, can also contribute to this um, in a way like allowing people's understanding to just broaden, shift, and deepen um, as uh, it continues to become uh, better understood and, and more widely embraced. Um, so I also wanted to just ask you and mention like your your whole world is so much more than just your scholarship and your teaching and writing. You're also an Aikido master. Uh, you you uh, run your own Aikido dojo, I, I believe, uh, in Berkeley. And um, you also have an ongoing web comic uh, that you've been you've been publishing. You've been uh, publishing a fictional series um, that's and I've also created a publishing house uh, along with um, some other colleagues and friends of yours. So how does all of your work fit together? Like uh, how does um, or does it? Just could you tell us a bit more about these kind of interesting, weird, diverse aspects of what you do and who you are? Yeah, I mean, this is kind of a, a symptom of the neuroquering that I'm talking about. Of that, you know, by by through this uh, embodied somatic process I've been going through of liberating my creative impulses, I find I'm just doing more and more weird, different stuff. Aikido is where it started for me in terms of somatic transformation, you know, and I've been, I've been practicing Aikido for more than 40 years at this point and teaching really my whole adult life, actually, since my late teens um, and managed to keep doing that throughout all sorts of mess. I mean, there were times when I was like, you know, homeless and still teaching Aikido. Uh, so that's been an ongoing theme and that's definitely informed my work. It's really shaped my work from drawing me towards somatic work and embodiment transformation through embodiment work in the first place. You know, it, there's that like, um, and also just in terms of the positivity of it, that, that uh, again, uh, part of my goal with neuroqueering is, yeah, I'll, the neurodiversity movement and really the field of neurodiversity studies so far has been very, uh, very much about uh, pushing back against the, the pathologizing and oppression of neuro-minority groups like autistic people. And that work is necessary and that work is important, you know, that it's, this is essentially, you know, uh, pushing back against ableism and such. And, and that's, that's essential work for the well-being of autistic people and other neuro minorities, um, you know, gotta happen. And it's increasingly not the work that I'm drawn to. You know, there's, there's more and more people who are coming in to do that work and that's wonderful, but I don't wanna see uh, neurodiversity as a concept where the field of neurodiversity studies is still emerging. I don't wanna see it get limited to that. I wanna see, I've always been fascinated by the creative potentials and in a sense, one has to have that in order to get anywhere. If you just fight against oppression, you have to fight against oppression. You have to push back against oppression. You know, we can't let ourselves get, get crushed and oppressed or, or, you know, or let other people get crushed and oppressed. But there has to be a positive vision we're working towards too. Otherwise, it's a losing battle. We have to be working towards something better and have a vision of how things can be beautiful uh, without the oppression. And that's missing so much. I actually, there was actually an, almost an essay that I wrote for the book, but I decided not to at the last minute just because I was like, okay, I'm gonna keep writing forever. I just gotta publish this thing as is. But I almost wrote something about how disappointed I was with the field of neurodiversity studies so far because it was still so essentialist and really just an extension of the field of disability studies. And I was like, why even, why not just be disability studies then? You know, we need the field of disability studies. We need the disability rights movement, but there's something else in this concept of neurodiversity. There's something else about the creative potentials of human neurodiversity. And that something else is what I'm interested in. And that, that comes from my Aikido training. That comes from the idea in Aikido that we can do something else besides fight, flight, freeze. Confronted with a bad situation, 
we can turn it into something graceful if we're willing to think outside of the limitations of fight, flight, freeze and outside of the limitations of this other person is my enemy. And so the idea of looking for positive solutions and getting out of a negative polarized mindset is something that I wouldn't have if it weren't ingrained in my body from four decades of Aikido practice. And neuroqueer theory comes as much from that as from anything else. And then of course, the other stuff, you know, yeah, I write speculative fiction. I write weird speculative fiction, uh, all of which is interconnected. Uh, I have a longtime collaborator, Andrew M. Reichart, wonderful. He's got a wonderful, uh, uh, some wonderful stuff out. He's got a, a, an amazing, weird, psychedelic sci-fi novel called Wallflower Assassin that I highly recommend. It's super neuroqueer. Um, and uh, all of our work is set in the same universe and interconnects, like his work and my, his stories and my stories interconnect. We've been writing, to, we've been friends since we were 15 and been writing together all that time, um, even though our publishing is, is a much more recent thing. Uh, so we co-write this web comic called Weird Luck, illustrated by uh, Mike Benowitz, who is a, a, just a genius. Just an, I'm just so blown away that somebody that talented is willing to illustrate uh, the stories I write. Um, but this, uh, yeah, so this web comic is still in its early stages. It's going to be a very long epic, and it's, we're only we only published about 50 pages of it so far. But weekly weekly web comic, page a week. And so, and, and interconnected with all of the fiction that Andrew and I write. And so, um, yeah, that's my favorite project right now is this webcomic. And definitely um, it's informed by, you know, I think of it as being neuroqueer, as a product of my neuroqueering, certainly a product of all the embodiment work and psychedelic work and stuff Andrew and I have done over the years. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just, um, I don't set out to teach a lesson about neuroqueering or anything. I just write the stories that come to me. And that's been very much, that creative liberation has just been very much, you know, a result of my, you know, I, I wanted to be a storyteller and creator of comics and fiction when I was real small. And I got cut off from my creativity by being stuck in a shell of fake uh, neuronormativity and heteronormativity. And when I liberated myself from that, it was just like, suddenly these ideas come to me and the characters just emerge from my unconscious and I need to write about them. And so it's just, it's a creative liberation and I'm just totally in love. I'm totally in love with that. I want to keep doing, you know, comics for the rest of my life. So yeah, everybody read the Weird Luck web comic. It's way more interesting than my nonfiction. Amazing. All right, we've got some Q&A from the wonderful audience that's here with us live. Yay, audience. So, um, so I'll start with a question from Viola. Um, what can neuroqueer people around the world do to promote awareness, research, and self-advocacy, especially in countries where the concept of neurodiversity is still widely unknown, misunderstood, and overlooked? This narration around autism and other neurodiversities is hugely pathologized and gatekept by so-called specialists who refuse to listen to neurodivergent people and inform themselves according to the most recent findings. Big question. Um, what you can do really depends on who you are and where you are. So. Um, uh, I'm very wary of proposing blanket solutions. I'm, uh, I think that in a sense, uh, this term post-normal that I use in the subtitle of the book, this term post-normal possibilities, the term post-normal comes um, from uh, uh, Zia Udin uh, Sardar, a futurist, who writes about how we live in post-normal times, meaning that, uh, uh, all our old concepts of normal and our old systems are failing catastrophically. And we live in this time of extreme uncertainty and complexity and chaos. And that's just gonna increase uh, as the old systems collapse. And the idea is new, new systems will have to emerge to take the place of the old collapsing systems. 
and new systems have to emerge on a grassroots level, often very locally in response to the very different circumstances of different, of different people and places. And so part of the old authoritarian systems that have failed us so much is this idea of blanket top-down policies. You know, this is the solution for everyone. And so I stay out of that. I'm like, um, yeah, okay, we need to get bust out of normativity, out of imposed normativity, but that's for the sake of freeing our creative impulses so that we can work together on a grassroots level. Where are we? What country are we talking about? What's the actual situation in this country? What's your particular community facing and what are the needs of your particular community rather than this is what everybody should be doing because it's just going to be different depending on your positionality. So um, generally speaking, though, my recommendation is uh, think creatively and positive, positively. Yes, the pathologizing is there, you know, it's, but you don't have to change the old systems. You don't have to change the systems. All you have to do is be able to bypass them. What can you do not to fight a huge entrenched system, but to build something better so you can ignore the huge entrenched system as much as possible and find ways to slip through the cracks around it? Thank you so much. Uh, so this question is from Evan. How do you view neuroqueerness in relation to people with physical disabilities? Like if our bodies don't move how we want them to, how can we access somatic body processing? You talk about trusting your body to move how it moves, but there are some disabilities that prevent that natural movement. How can we make neuroqueering accessible? I disagree with the premise of the question because uh, um, nothing, um, there's no body, there's no type of body mind or issue in the body mind that prevents natural movement. It's just that different body minds, have different things that are natural for them. I think that, I think that the concept that there's one kind of natural movement is part of what we're fighting against. It's part of the normativity that we're pushing back against. So, um, you can, you can be uh, physically impaired in all kinds of exciting ways and uh, very restricted in what you can do. And yet there's still ways that your particular body mind can express it. When I say free your embodiment, I don't mean everybody has to be a, a gymnast and a world-class swing dancer in order, because I'm sure as heck not, you know, I'm, I'm, a, 53 year old person with a body suffering from, you know, extensive trauma history, you know, my, my, a lot of my joints barely work. And so, you know, it's not about athleticism. It's not about how big a range of motion do you have? It's about, can you open up your body to uh, allow liberation and allow feeling in the particular way that your body can do? And so it is accessible. It only becomes inaccessible if we decide that there is a natural way to move. That's the, neuro the normativity we're breaking away from. It only becomes inaccessible if you're like, you have to get on your feet and dance and ground your feet to do this. Then obviously you're cutting out a huge population of human beings who can't do that, you know, who can't, you know, who can't stand up on their own, um, much less dance. But we're not, we're, I'm, you know, I'm not saying that. I'm saying, yeah, explore what your body does. So it's automatically accessible. As soon as you drop the idea that there's one natural way to move, it becomes accessible to anybody. So this question is from the audience, an anonymous attendee of the audience. Uh, do you have advice for living in very repressive cultures and locales? with institutions and hierarchies that make us suppress our neurodivergence and queerness? Yeah, find, um, create, find ways to create spaces where you can do it. So that may mean, I mean, that's even the case, you know, 
repressive cultures and locales. I mean, there's plenty of that right here in the US, you know, and especially for certain groups of people. You know, if you're if you're black in the urban US, you know, you deviate from norm from normativity, from normative embodiment out in public, you know, you're gonna get targeted by the police who might already be gunning for you just because of the color of your skin. So those oppressions are very real. And the answer is create the spaces that you can to be free, to be you. And it becomes much more bearable to put on the act of normativity if you're not stuck doing it full time. If you're living full time, carrying that oppression in your body, it's awful. And, you know, just keeps the mind trapped and limited. But if you have a, a space and even a tiny community and a tiny space where you can be yourself some of the time and explore that neuroqueer embodiment and play some of the time, then it becomes possible to be like, okay, I'm just going to put on my normative mask and go out and when I go out in public um, and gradually we we're like little flowers growing up through the cracks in the sidewalk, making and finding the spaces that we can and recognizing that we're not gonna be able to get away with it everywhere. This is from Sabian. In a, word, in a world drastically shifting towards cyber engagement, how do you think institutionalized social systemic ideologies obstruct individuals and communities alike? to access resources and information on learning more about themselves as neuroqueer, especially for people of color who are not from the US, who are deeply impacted by white supremacy, which largely influences the internet. I think the internet uh, has been uh, a huge uh, avenue for liberation for people because you can find people, like-minded people and exchange ideas and find people, find these radical ideas. This, my book, my work wouldn't have caught on without the internet, you know? It's not a book that I think a mainstream publishing house would have published and promoted, but it's possible for information to get out there that uh, might be blocked by the mainstream. I, uh, um, and again, I think I've already addressed this question a lot that, um, you know, the, there's different communities are gonna have to find their own solutions for how do we create spaces that are uh, uh, liberatory and safe for us to explore and how do we expand those spaces and work in the cracks around the collapsing repressive systems, which are still gonna be around for a long time and are gonna get more and more desperate and ugly as they collapse, you know, how do we work around? Um, all of the repressive systems and find the little openings to play and create those openings and enlarge them. But I think uh, access to information is, and especially to subversive information is just increasing. And it's easy to look at where it's not and where it's impacted by systems of oppression like white supremacy and patriarchy but look for where the freedom is. This is my, my Aikido lesson that has transformed my life is uh, uh, if you look at where the obstacles and the oppressions are, that's all you're ever gonna see. We know the obstacles are there. We know the systemic oppression is real. Now look for the openings because they're also there. This question is from Iris. Mm -hmm. I'm an autistic physical therapist working with adults with chronic pain, and I'm really interested in the idea of helping neurodivergent people to explore their authentic embodiment, especially movement patterns. Do you know of anyone who is researching or potentially interested in researching the effect of movement therapy to allow for exploration of authentic embodiment in neurodivergent people to address chronic pain? Uh, yeah, there's some fascinating work out there in the somatic field already. Um, 
uh, you know, and tools that can be taken to. And so uh, 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 this, this method, the mode called Continuum by Emily Conrad Dowd specifically explores this stuff. Look at, uh, look for Emily Conrad's book, um, Life on Land. Uh, wonderful stuff. Um, authentic movement. Sometimes there's tools out there like body mind centering, you know, body Bainbridge Cohen's work or this beautiful work, authentic movement, which I love. Uh, just uh, um, things like even things like Alexander technique, just all sorts of somatic techniques that can be used. And again, I'm always saying, look for the opportunities. Don't look for where something is lacking or where there's a, an oppression or something. Like you might go to study, you know, a particular somatic method, authentic movement or body mind centering or, uh, you know, continuum or whatever. And you might find, oh, nobody is really talking about neurodivergent people with chronic pain here. Like it's very, you know, this is very like uh, uh, white and normative and stuff, but don't ignore that. Just say, what can I take from this and turn to my own purposes? Like there's things like continuum and body mind centering and authentic movement and such that have been used in various ways. There's all sorts of, Alexander technique, another great example. There's all sorts of different somatic techniques that have been used around chronic pain. And you can get training in that and say, okay, how do I wanna combine this with neuroqueer ideas? And if nobody has done that work, it just means that you get to do it. This is uh, an anonymous question from the audience. To liberate the body sometimes is very vulnerable. Yes. How can we support ourselves in this situation? Um, I think in a sense, you answer your own question here because the important thing is to be aware of the fact that it is vulnerable and that you do need to support yourself in some way. And it, in a sense, if you listen to the body deeply enough as you liberate it, it will tell you, it will tell you, you know, I need more time to integrate. Listen to that, you know, learning to listen to yourself. I need more time to integrate uh, is important. Um, and what are my safe spaces? You know, okay, like this month maybe, I won't have access to a safe space for integration. So maybe this month I won't be doing intensive somatic work and intensive deep liberatory work because I don't have a safe space to integrate it, but let me make sure that, you know, how do I construct a safe space for it? How do I, how do I construct some, make some time for integration and such? And yeah, respect that vulnerability. And again, Aikido has been really good for me in that regard. It's been a really good resource. Uh, martial arts in general, I recommend as a resource because they they help one learn how to feel safe and grounded in one's body. And so if you're gonna start breaking open all tensions and releasing all traumas, it helps to be able to physically also give yourself a sense of safety and understand it's like uh, there's, a, there's a yin and yang dance to do of balancing liberatory action with stabilizing action. And there's somatic tools available for all of those things. So definitely look into that. Really think before you do some deep liberatory work of how am I going to stabilize and support this? This question is from Jess. In France, we are fighting primarily for deinstitutionalization and respect of human rights for disabled people. And while I can see how changes in my own embodiment of my autism and other non-normative cognitive ways of being, it's hard to draw lines between this and the activist work we do. How can the self-liberation through creative queer embodiment contribute concretely to self-advocate activism? Largely because it becomes a source of creative energy. Because again, um, uh, 
activism, you know, any kind of social justice activism um, that you're doing, you need something positive to aim for and you need a way to replenish yourself and maintain and build your own vitality. And so it might be very separate. It might be a very separate thing. Your exploration, your self-liberation and exploration through creative career embodiment, that might be very separate from your activism on the surface, but activists burn out. And one of the thing, reasons activists burn out one of the, the big reasons that activists burn out largely is because they're always locked into the struggle and um, into this op very draining oppositional mindset. And you need a place where you can break out of that. If your own embodiment is stuck entirely in opposition and focus on the negative and on the struggle and nothing else, you're gonna burn out, you're gonna break, you're gonna be unable to see opportunities for positive solutions beyond just fighting and fighting. And so you liberate your own creative queer embodiment so that you have something else, you have something positive to aim for and some way of continually replenishing your vitality and being able to be open to the creative. And so you don't get eaten by your own struggle. Okay, a question from Shreya. Are there online uni classes or forums where we could learn and discuss neuroqueering and all the aspects of being neurodivergent and queer? More and more. It's happening more and more. It's catching on. Um, you can create them. You know, if you're in an academic setting, you can create that stuff. You can, if you're, you don't even have to be faculty, you can create student groups and invite i do a lot of speaking as a guest speaker where sometimes it's a student group that's invited me or a student group that's put pressure on the administration or the faculty of some department to invite me in and you know they get yeah, the they just or they just read my book or something and they start playing with it people just start creating these spaces are there classes i mean i teach an intro to neurodiversity studies class in the undergrad psych program here at cis and i bring these neuroqueer elements into a lot of my uh somatic teaching and into all the teaching i do uh as much as i can um and yeah, I think this is growing. I think this is expanding. I keep hearing from people who are reading my book, uh, you know, in their classes, who are assigning my book in their in their classes. And um, what I'd like to see, for me, I always try to bring it to the experiential too, you know, bring it to uh, certainly in my somatic teaching. How do I bring this into experiential practice? How do we open up the discussion into you know how this affects our lives and what are the different aspects and i think that that's something people can push for to say you know you know i want to bring these topics into my academic setting and then i also want to uh bring the practice i want to work with my colleagues or my fellow students about how do we practice this and how do we create more space for this in our academic life? So I think it's happening. And I think, you know, the answer is if it's not happening uh, uh, enough for you where you are, look for the opportunities to make it happen and the other people who wanna work with you to make it happen. Are there other people who write about and do work around neuroqueering who you would suggest looking into? Um, yeah, definitely, um, some of them more explicitly than others. So, um, you know, my answers are sometimes surprising because again, I, uh, I mean, I recommend looking into queer theory in general, you know, I love the work of Judith Butler and she's, you know, they're not talking, uh, they're not, they're not talking about, uh, uh, neuroqueering per se, they're talking about just queering, they're talking about it in the gender sense, but that's part of the roots of it. You know, all of the, all of the people writing about queer theory and doing work about that, um, 
people explicitly writing about neuroqueering. Um, Remy Yergo, uh, Yergo's book, Authoring Autism, uh, is, is great stuff there. Um, and then there's a lot of stuff that as, as part of the DNA of, uh, of neuroqueering, even though it predates it, you know, it's part of like, um, you know, I mentioned, you know, Tim Leary, Robert Atten Wilson, Antero Ali, who, who ran uh, the group Paratheatrical Research, um, that where I did so much of my, my deeper somatic transformative work. Um, people who are, you know, just doing somatic work, authentic movement and five rhythms work and such, which is not explicitly neuroqueer. They're not talking about neuroqueer, but it's tools that we can use for neuroqueering. Um, also, uh, oh, I like fiction as a way to awaken our minds to possibilities. And there's a growing field of neuroqueer speculative fiction. Uh, authors like Dora, Dora Raymaker and Ada Hoffman um, that are, you know, uh, uh, my, my publishing house, Autonomous Press, has a, an annual neuroqueer lit anthology called the Spoon Knife Anthology um, and that's just full of neuroqueer uh, fiction and poetry and such of multiple uh, genres and just sort of exploring, well, what does it mean? What does neuroqueer lit mean? What does it mean to neuroqueer literature? And I think that, I think it's important to be looking at stories and poetry also in terms of uh, work around neuroqueering. I think that often that's how ideas uh, spread, that the stories, and stories will speak, you know, fiction will speak directly to the unconscious. And I certainly, I mean, yeah, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I'm at with these concepts and this practice of neuroqueering without somatic practice, without you know the things I learned in the CIF somatics program, and without um, without uh, you know my work in Aikido and paratheatrical research and reading people like Robert Anton Wilson in my youth and such. But also, I wouldn't be. You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't be tuned to this work without you know the writings of Samuel R. Delaney. You know, Delaney's books like Babel Seventeen and Dahlgren and such really just like wow, this was a a, a neuroqueer person. You know, Delaney's books to me are all about neuroqueering, even though he predates that term by a long time. But he is definitely a neurodivergent queer person who is envisioning cultures and conjunctions of people and ways of being that are explicitly neuroqueer. And that was life-changing for me in my teens to read uh, books like Dahlgren and Triton and Babel 17 um, uh, by Delaney and be like, you know, have this, this you know, uh, you know, black queer neurodivergent sci-fi author just rocked my world. And that, that gave me something to aim for in terms of the world I wanted to see uh, more than any nonfiction or other practice that I engaged in. All right, well, that's, uh, that's our last question. And um, I, I'm hearing that people want us to show the book again. So I'm gonna hold it up. It's got this beautiful cover design. I don't know if you want to say anything about this. I, this I want to credit. Uh, I want to credit the amazing Cassandra Johns for doing the cover. Uh, Cassandra, you can find Cassandra's uh, work at houseofhands.net. Um, and uh, yeah, amazing designer. She did. Uh, Cassandra actually designed the whole interior of the book too. Did the typesetting and everything. Uh, amazing person to work with. And uh, the cover is uh, a a collaboration in a way because uh, I picked the color scheme uh, based on my own taste and suggested, you know, that that uh, what I call the neurofly, that butterfly brain design is is kind of a, a long standing uh, uh, symbol I, I use in my work. And so, but that's her original, Cassandra's original rendition of 
of of that of that design um you know drew that herself and just uh really executed the whole design so beautifully i'm really lucky to work with other you know wildly neuroqueer people and stuff and i also want to say by the way um as an autistic uh uh person it was very important to me uh, the cover not only look great but also have a good texture i do get a lot of feedback from autistic people uh, talking about how good the book feels so please do get a copy of the book and actually stroke the cover well nick thank you so much for writing this book for sharing um, so much of it tonight with us i, I think that this has been um, hopefully something that uh, sparks a lot for people and and uh, inspires people to go further um, with your work with their own uh, personal processes uh, wherever they find themselves um, so i'm just on behalf of everyone just really grateful for what you're doing in the world and um, thanks for being here tonight with us thank you thank you so much and thank you so much for being my interviewer and partner in this in this conversation it's wonderful to work with you and it's thanks, an honor. Thanks to everybody who I can't I can't see the audience, but I believe that you're out there. And thank you all for for joining us. All right. Thank you so much, Nick. We'll turn it over to Jason now to close.